Wait, looks like we're live. Can everyone hear me okay? Just tell people on Twitch. Uh, stream notifications. <clears throat> well all right folks i think we can get started today today what i want to be covering is this like really interesting new paper that came out by sam gross uh earlier this week so sam gross is one of the inventors of pytorch so definitely you know like sort of insane engineer and, and the paper he wrote was basically Py python multi-threading without the gill uh, so he he published it as a as a Google Doc. We're going to be going over it, some of the background that you need to understand this paper, why it's a big deal, and why has it been so hard to do multi-threading in Python in, in the first place? And you know, screw it. Like, and what is multi-threading to you know to, to even begin with, right? So so hopefully you know, please please bring any questions you have. Like, I want this to be uh, like a, a beginner friendly stream. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in chat uh and yeah i mean i i hope you all enjoy this so without further ado let's get started i'm setting up chat on my phone right here and thank you for the subscription antonio uh i really appreciate it all right excellent so uh, let's just get started so the paper basically uh so this is the paper oh another subscribe uh thank you thank you thank you appreciate it Pe pedekin i appreciate it folks um so again so like i said so so uh, this is not just like a proposal, actually. This is like the, the, it has a fully working prototype uh, right now. So if you go to the uh, to the GitHub repo, Python without Gil, I don't know if this is possible to not. Yeah, same here. So uh, that's actually why I've been really wanting to read this paper. I thought it was sort of impossible. Uh, some of us say things are impossible, and and others, you know, prove why it's why it is or isn't right. Uh, so just as a prototype for what this actually looks like, right? So he's saying, for example, this is a Fibonacci function. Uh, so this is a vanilla Fibonacci function. Uh, an alternative for it would be saying, okay, well, let's say we have eight threads and then you read, and or like you can read the number of threads from argv so that you can call this like this. Uh, so this does 20 times the amount of work. And basically he's saying it's about 20 times faster, right? So doing it like, so you, you use this basically this, scope here which is a thread pool executor which takes in a number of threads and just executes uh, a certain function right so in this case it's fibonacci the, the 34 first fibonacci numbers right that are being submitted to a thread pool a thread pool is basically just like a bunch of threads uh and then it's called a pool because but when you're when you're trying to let's say accomplish certain tasks you look at the pool and you decide okay what's an available thread right now so this is like what it looks like, right? And and you know when you're thinking about it, this is kind of a big deal because like let's say here on a tw twenty core Intel Xeon, one thread takes one point five seconds and twenty threads takes one point fifty two seconds. So it's about the same amount of time, but yet twenty times the amount of work. So and you know if you're thinking, okay, twenty times sounds great, like it actually gets even better. Like I mean, let's say we're using something like my CPU. How many cores does this thing have? Like I have sixteen cores right here so actually this has uh available cores okay so no so, so his core is, is fancier so i think i have 16 physical cores and then 32 like logical processors right so yeah so in my case it would be 32 times uh faster so you're like okay great you know th this sounds amazing like how, how do we how, how do we get this right and so what i like about this this uh the, the, like what, what I like about this proposal is it actually goes over a lot of the background. You need to understand this. Um, so let's just go over it, right? Like we'll we'll be covering some pseudocode as, as as required, or sometimes we'll just like be reading and seeing what's possible, right? 
So what, what Sam is saying is that it's, see, so sort of the TLDR of this whole document is that it is possible to remove the gill from Python. There's a trade-off uh, to remove it, uh, but he's saying the trade-offs are manageable. And the main technical ideas, such as reference counting, allocator changes, and thread safety scheme should serve as a basis for such an effort, right? So just as a sort of background here, uh, like what's reference counting, for example? I mean, let's just do a whiteboard. Right, on this whiteboard, you can do this. Okay, yeah. So let's say you have some sort of like object A in memory, right? So this is object A. Let's say object A, for example, right? And so object A is used in a function one, it's used in function two, and it's used in function uh, three, right? So, yo, Pseudomaze, how's it going? It's nice to see you again. Um, so, wh why am I showing you this? Well, like when you think about stuff like, mem like when people talk, yo, Cas9, nice to see you. When people talk about like memory management, the thing they're really referring to uh, is this. Right? Oh, so wow, 14 viewers, like thank you, thank you everyone. So you basically have an object in memory and then you're deciding whether you can actually get rid of it, right? And how do you, how, like, how do you know whether you can get rid of it? Well, that means like, let's say in a typical function, Let's so have a function like define uh, func1, right? And then this function takes in, like, let's say a, and then it basically says, okay, well, we have this thing called b equals five, and then return uh, a times five, right? So this is what your function is. Uh, when this function ed ends, you know that you no longer need the a, at least for this function. And you know that you don't need the B for this one, or you don't need the B either, at least here in this function. So the way this works in Python is that every object has what's called a reference count, or really in any 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 language that has uh, like garbage collection. So what a ref count is, is basically like, let's say back to this example right here, like it will say, well, func, func one, func two, func three are all being used, are all using obj A. So this will increment ref count will be, oh, thank you for the subscription. So here the ref count will be three, right? And the, the, the reason why this is important is that, hey, we saw the data leak mark. I know you made banks. So when are you leaving PyTorch? The data leak, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, so it seems like people have started to survey my bank account. This was not the kind of like recognition I want. It's like getting some creepy comments in Twitch. I wonder what data leak this is about. No, this, this comments always freak me out. Regardless, like, so, so ref count three here uh, basically means the Twitch leak. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm not, I'm not Hassan Abi or something, you know, uh, if only. Uh, ooh, I see. Okay. So basically here, so every time there's going to be a new function that uses this object, we're going to increment the reference count for it. And when the ref count of an object hits zero, then we can basically get rid of object A. Right, so this is sort of the, the main idea behind ref counting. And we'll, we'll talk about like how, how this comes up here. The other tricks they like he talks about are allocator changes and thread safety scheme. I'm not really sure what he means, so so let's see. Uh, so first off, you know, he's sort of, it's a, this is a very modest proposal, I will say, in, in the sense that it starts off by saying that it's not like, oh, the gill has been removed. It's more like removing the gill is hard. It's going to require like multiple years of effort. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the subscribes, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, so I believe we can make a future of CPython. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so if we keep the gill focused only on single thread performance, we could achieve even better single thread performance. This is great. Uh, and most Python programs are not optimized for multi-threading performance. They will like require changes to take advantage of running without the Go. Like this is right, right? Like let's say a lot of existing uh, Python code will use multiprocessing and we'll cover what multiprocessing is in a second and how it's different for multi-threading. Uh, Multi-threaded programs are prone to concurrency bugs, right? And you know, maybe, uh, maybe we should talk about shared memory for a second. I think it'll make things a bit clearer. Oh, 20 people. Thank you everyone for the attention. I haven't streamed in forever, so it's it's nice to see you all here. It's encouraging. All right. 
So the idea behind uh, shared memory is that you have the same amount of, like you have the same data that's being accessed by multiple processes or multiple programs. Um, and then shared memory is, is really also efficient because like, let's say you want to have two programs that communicate between each other. Uh, well, they could do it via disk, but then, you know, you're reading stuff from disk, right? So ideally what you want to do is for them to share data and in, in essentially what's called uh, sh shared memory. Uh, multiprocessing doesn't have shared memory. And so as a result, communication and multiprocessing, which is how you typically do multiprocess stuff in Python, um, is, 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 very slow, is, is, is very slow, right? So let's just do very more, more of like, an, uh, like, yeah. So let's just do more of a talk about threads versus processes for a second, like at least for, for the Python programmer. Right, so by the way, so thank you for the subscribes. I super appreciate it. So Hamel actually had a great tutorial about this in Python, so I'd recommend you check it out. I think it's called multi-threaded Python or something, but let me just give you some of the trade-offs and 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 when actually threading does actually help in, in Python. So multi-processing essentially means that you wanna basically run multiple version of, oh, so we have, we, we have the funk is now following us. Uh, so you have multiple versions of a Python program running at once. So basically you have program one, right? And then it has its own memory, like memory one. And then you have program two. And this is memory two. Uh, program three. Uh, memory three. Right, so it sort of it looks a bit like this. Whereas multi-threading is more like program one, program two, program three. Uh, this is memory. It looks a bit like this. Right, so why is this important? Um, essentially, within the context of multiprocessing, uh, let's cover like a few examples. Like let's say you wanna, uh, I don't know, like let's say, let's say you have like a list in Python, for example, or I don't know, let's say you wanna sort 10 lists at once. Um, so you want to basically sort uh, like list one, list two, all the way to list n, and then this also returns a bunch of lists. So this returns like a list of lists. Uh, what you could do is basically process one runs uh, sort uh, sort l one, and then process n runs sort uh, l n. So the reason I'm saying it this way is really because what the point I want to make is like these are sort of like very like parallel operations as in there's no communication here at all. Another example though, like and, and where like sub multi-threading is more relevant is like, well, let's say you want to do something like you basically have a program. So like, let's say define a train, right? And then what this does is it's first, like let's say download data And then like build model. So this is model equal this, and then it's gonna basically do something. So then data and then model. So basically output equals model of data. So something like this, right? And then return output. So let's say you have some sort of function that looks like this. Well, download data is very slow. Uh, and it's going to be bottlenecked by I.O. And so effectively what you want to do is you want to launch a thread. And then you want to continue doing the, this. And then here, when you actually need the data, you would synchronize and you would make sure to wait for the result of the multi-threaded call. Uh, and then this is just like regular synchronous code again. Okay. So the way this works right now is a lot of these download libraries or these like low level primitives or libraries that download data are all implemented in C where you can do this kind of multi-threading very easily. However, in Python, that's not the case because Python has tada, what's called the global interpreter lock. Okay, the global interpreter lock. So what is the global? Oh, thank you for the subscribe, I am super grateful. So what is the global interpreter lock? The global interpreter lock is essentially saying like when you're basically all Python programs run on a single thread. 
I'm getting an insane amount of subscribers today. Like, this is really nice. Thank you, everyone. So, did someone retweet me or something? Someone famous? Uh, okay, so, so Python programs run on a single thread. Uh, yeah, so, so, Py yeah, so Python pro programs all run on a single thread, uh, which basically means that if you are trying to launch multiple threads, what's effectively going to happen is that you have one thread that's going to be switching between your pretend threads. So they are running concurrently, but you're not getting any speed ups out of it, which sucks because like, let's say for stuff like, I don't know, PyTorch programs, for example, uh, you know, you could take advantage of like thre threading, like when doing like op level automatic rate, like when, when you're doing something like automatic differentiation over various like weights or whatever, like these are operations that you would like to parallelize ideally as much as possible, uh, but you cannot do it in Python. And that's one of the reasons why like a library like PyTorch basically has a Python front end. With uh with with a with a C plus uh, plus backend, right? So the gil is one of the reasons why we have uh like the, this two language problem in Python. All right. So as in the gil is not a problem if you're willing to just rewrite all of your Python code in C. But the reason we're all writing our code in, in Python is because you know Python's easier to write than C, and you don't have to deal with memory management or think about all this fancy stuff. Um, great. So let's go back here. Um, so he does. So Sam does mention that there's like a bunch of projects that are aiming to to solve this. So one is, for example, called like the multiple interpreter, where it aims to replace the global interpreter lock with a per interpreter lock. As in, let's say you're mu running multiple Python programs, then each one of them would have a gil. To which you may say, wait a minute, isn't that already the way it works? Well, you know, no. And and, and that's actually why um, like multi-threaded performance is so poor in, in Python. Uh, Pseudomaze, help me out like with moderating some of the questions. Uh, it's just going to be a bit difficult uh, to, to see everyone. So does PyTorch just automatically run these on, uh, on real threads? I mean, yeah, like PyTorch is mostly a C library. Uh, then another question. So Tala Frank, this is off topic and maybe for the end of the stream, but have you ever checked in memory computing like mem resistor based systems? They are like native matrix vector multiplication uh, computing units. Very speculative though. I have This is the first time I hear of them, so I apologize. I don't have more information. Okay. So the project aims for a concurrency model that matches the threads plus shared memory model implemented in common operating systems and programming languages like Java and C++ and Swift. And so we aim for similar safety guarantees to Java and Go. Um, as in, it's not like data races are impossible, but data races won't corrupt your VM code, as in you won't get a seg fault. Like you're not gonna get a program that completely crashes. Uh, so the shared model memory is notoriously difficult to program correctly, but provides a good base to build abstractions because it closely matches the primitives uh, provided by the operating system. Um, example, threads and mutexes, right? So back to, well, why is it that uh, Python is sort of always insufficient for high performance code is because the, the and this is something Chris Latner said, like the inventor of LLVM and Swift, is that the gil increases complexity throughout the stack in large scale settings and it prevents authors from achieving reasonable performance for some things without themselves writing C++ and CUDA. Again, so it comes down to you write something in Python if it requires threading in some way or the memory management, or if it requires like some notion of shared memory, that's gonna be very slow. Let me give you a very simple application of when shared memory can really suffer actually. Like, like, like well, when does this really come up? Like let's say in the context of a machine learning model, right? So let's say I'm running a web server, right? So this is a web server. And this is running a PyTorch program. And then I have a bunch of clients and they're each going to make a request where they're basically asking for the result of model.forward back. So now imagine that this is running like on a big box server, right? This web server. So every time you make an inference, do you really want to copy a PyTorch model? 
right? Feels like probably not, right? Because let's say the model is about a gig big. And if you have like more than 40 requests coming in, uh, you know, just not just a very modest number of requests, you're gonna have 40 gigs, so it's gonna surpass most GPUs on device memory. Uh, you're gonna run out of memory on your GPU, even though all you've done is have a client with 40 requests. So example, like here for inferencing, for example, you need to think of your model as, or your model weights as a global variable that makes certain inferences. Uh, and this basically prevents you from duplicating data when you don't need to. Uh, and then you want like a bunch of threads to be able to access this model concurrently. And given that they're not gonna modify it, it's it's fine, right? Like, and even if they do, maybe it's not the biggest deal. But again, it's just, just, just something to think about as to a very obvious use case as to what, where shared memory really matters within the case, context of machine learning. Um, right. So another thing, another comment I really like here is that like, let's say you created like Python, you know, three, like 4.0, right? Which is likely when this change would be considered. Uh, then in that case, you need to make the case, well, is this going to improve the default out of the box performance for NumPy and PyTorch? Well, you know, probably not because all of those libraries are not written with Python multi-threading in mind. They're all written with like their core kernels, either in BLOSS or in C or whatever. Uh, and so it's just like unlikely that uh, the performance will be there out of the box, but at least it shows that people for people it's possible. And if it's easy to write it, then you'd expect a new set of programs and libraries to take advantage of this, but it's not gonna be sort of this magical change that's suddenly gonna make all Python software or PyTorch code super fast. Like that's just not the case. So as far as multiprocessing goes, like there's this meme that like multiprocessing is like heavier weight, right? So it always helps to actually just like look at some baseline numbers. So for example, starting a thread uh, takes about a hundred like microseconds, uh, but starting a subprocess takes about 50 milliseconds. So that's what like three orders of magnitude larger, right? So much, much, much slower. All again, doesn't matter within the context of these times, but like imagine I tell you then, you know, you can reduce training time from 100 days, which is three months to a day, all of a sudden it's a lot more interesting, right? So think of these speed ups in terms of days to get like a sense of scale of how, how, how big of a deal they are. So the way uh, Python multiprocessing works is via two paradigms. So the first one is called fork and the second one is called spawn. Uh, so what fork is, is basically when you're creating a new process, when you fork it, you're basically saying, I'm just gonna create like a copy of the old process. So this is gonna include the virtual memory, the loaded modules, like all the constructed objects in memory. So the full model state will, will all be there. And then it's copy on write and that like, when you're basically trying to write to something, then because you're changing the same shared memory, other, pro other processes may not be assuming that this is gonna change. So instead of corrupting data or changing data that people don't expect to change, right? Because people don't expect things that are not in their program to change the state of an OS, right? Then what you do is you basically copy the data and then you change that copy. So that's why it's called copy on write. But if you're just reading data, then you never need to copy anything. So this is super efficient. So. Basically, the TLDR of that is fork is fast. Uh, it's unsafe in the sense that if you're not writing back, it's unsafe. And it could be kind of bloated because you are sort of copying everything, right? And then the other main paradigm is what's called spawn. And so what spawn is, is you start a Python process from scratch. So, you know, you don't have the parents like file descriptors, threads or anything like that. Uh, and then the child process basically just calls exec and then it basically starts running code. So Kudblu said, have you thought about the software and game development category on Twitch instead? Might get some more viewers that way. Uh, I did not actually, and thank you for that heads up. I will do that from now on. I think Pseudomaze, isn't there like a bot where we can change the stream category? Maybe might as well just do that now. I think that sounds like a great idea. Thank you. Um, all right, so back to threading. So Python provides a threading library that maps to OS threads. It also provides locks. So locks are basically saying, like, look, when I'm changing this data, like no other program is allowed to do anything. And this can cause like locking behavior where, well, like no one else can write, 
because it's locked and at the same time for some whatever reason you couldn't unlock something and then your program is deadlocked and just sort of nothing happens so this is like very bad and 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 you want to avoid it probably like the only way to get rid of it is like what's called like deadlock avoidance usually with some loop or some counter where you're like okay well nothing's really happened uh, multi-processing over it is super slow for any real-time application yeah i mean so so again so think of it like, like let's look at this number right 50 milliseconds like i think when you think of real time uh real time basically means sub 10 milliseconds right like 50 milliseconds is, is, is a deal breaker think of example there's lots of applications of this like microsoft for example did studies with bank where like a couple of milliseconds of latency to search like made them lose like millions of dollars uh, I believe like the Chinese government made like Google irrelevant by adding some latency to uh, Google search. Uh, so there's like, again, you don't have to add a lot. It's just like a couple of milliseconds and all of a sudden the thing is unusable, right? Um, all right. So internal parallelization and C code. So functions implemented in C can use multiple threads. So for example, Intel's NumPy distribution. Yeah, yes, this is, you read this right? Like Intel's NumPy distribution. Uh, you only took in further the bots from your site to work with commands. Oh, I see. Okay, uh, that that's all good. I will do that later. So, use this technique to internally parallelize individual operations, and it works well when the basic operations are are large enough. So sometimes it requires rewriting large parts of your program. Yeah. Okay, this is all nice and great. Okay, great. So now we're finally talking about reference counting, right? So remember when 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 we talked about like let's say now there's a new function that's using some data, then you would basically call pi increment reference. And if there's a function that's no longer using some data, then you call pi decrement reference, right? Uh, so replacing these with atomic variants would result in a 60% average slowdown on the pi performance benchmark suite, right? So what this project does instead um, is what's called like biased reference counting. So it's each object is associated with an owning thread. And reference counting from the op owning thread uses non-atomic operation to modify. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Let, let me just explain this. I think it'll be easier with the picture. So basically, typically a thread count, like basically a ref count, you can think of it as being like, let's say some sort of dictionary that takes in like an object and then it returns a reference. Instead, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a ref count that takes in an object and a thread ID, and then this is gonna give you a reference count, right? And so this is sort of like the, the main design change in how ref counts are done. And this uh, ideally lets us do like multi-threaded Python without worrying about the gill. The reason why the gill is here in the first place was supposedly to make reference counting easier, but it seems like Sam sort of, I, I guess, like broke this uh, broke this assumption. Uh, so bias reference counting is performant uh, for access to same thread object. So most accesses fall into this category, uh, but then there's a few objects that are accessed by multiple thread. And then this project uses two techniques, immortalization and deferred reference counting to improve the performance. Make use of the least significant bits of the local reference count. Uh, adjust reference count field by four, but that's invisible to code that doesn't access the field directly. Uh, it does kind of sound like Rust's concurrency model, right? Or at least I think it's inspired. Did they mention Rust at all here? They do not mention Rust. Uh, deferred reference count. Uh, okay, I see. So this is how they make it backwards compat, right? So this is important, by the way. So they make use of the least two least significant bits in the local reference count. Uh, so there's two bits, right? And then they can say, is it immortalized? Yes, no. And then is it the deferred reference count? Yes or no, right? So you just need two bits for that. And it's the last bits of the local count. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can still like keep the behavior on you. So this is nice to sort of keep like backwards compat and make sure that like, even though you did change, uh, make Python multi-threaded, you don't have to break everyone's like user code. I think that that just like would never, like that would never pass, right? Because this is a real, like Python's not a toy project anymore, right? Uh, some objects such as intern string, integers, uh, statically allocated objects, stay alive for the lifetime of a program. So these objects are marked by Im immortal. And so this avoids contention on the reference count fields of these objects when they're accessed concurrently by multiple threads. Uh, all right, so basically just never get rid of these. 
right? So uh, I, I guess, yeah, instance strings, so uh, statically allocated PyType object. So so stuff like the true non, okay. So, so yeah, so again, so these are not like instances of things that are true or false. Like these are the true, false, and non objects, which are things that will probably be like, you're, you're probably gonna have some Boolean at some point in your program, right? So you probably keep these. And this is where immortalization helps. And that way you don't have to worry about reference counting these things. Uh, because you just know they're immortal. So you just don't update the counts for them at all. So CPython does not currently support immortalization because the cost of supporting it is slightly larger than the savings from avoiding reference count operations in a single-threaded environment. But then the trade-off changes in a multi-threaded, multi-core environment. Avoiding contention on reference count fields becomes much more important. Okay, great. So this is the first trick, immortalization. Just for some objects, like don't don't bother with reference counting, and then use an int to to mark these objects as not needing reference counting. The second trick is a deferred reference counting. So a few types of objects, such as top level functions, code objects, modules, tend to be frequently accessed by many threads concurrently, but don't necessarily live for the lifetime of the program. So immortalization is not a good fit. So what they use is a variant of deferred reference counting to avoid contention on the reference count field of these objects. Um, Okay, this might be problematic. Uh, it's limited to a few places, like the interpreter. As unaware of the first two, just like any other objects, we have normally. Uh, the pi increment reference calls outside the interpreter remains necessary to ensure that these objects are not free too soon. Uh, yeah. Oh, shy time. How's it going? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Sanya. Thanks for joining. Um. Yeah, I mean, this is a paper I was very excited about. Like, I'm also very tired. I I, I woke up at 5 a.m. today to watch the like Dota TI TI 10 championship. So, uh, I am very much sleep deprived as well. So, so thank you for joining me. Um, all right. So, I guess here what what they really mean by deferred reference counting is that these are not immortal objects and that they're going to probably exist forever. But you don't need to manage the reference counting for things like modules very aggressively because they're likely to just keep being used by multiple threads. And so again, I think this is sort of a uh, so, so 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 again, this is sort of like the same trick where you're just like, well, some stuff just doesn't like it just doesn't matter. How, like instead of dealing with contentious reference counting or complicated reference counting, this proposal is like don't do reference counting here. Right. So this is sort of like like where why this trick is important. So Python's built-in pi malloc, uh, malloc a memory allocator is not thread safe. So this project replaces pi malloc with min alloc, a memory allocator developed by Dan Lijin at Microsoft. I've never heard of this project. Okay, so I, I have it started already, of course. So it's a general purpose allocator with excellent performance characteristic with a runtime for the COCA and lean languages. <laughs> it's used in Death Stranding. That's cool. Bing, Azure, and Death Stranding. <laughs> There's definitely like an odd, an, an odd thing uh, out there. That's kind of cool, actually, though. Um. Okay. So, yeah. Like it's like what. Additionally, min alloc like layout of objects in the heap allows for finding all garbage collected tracked objects without maintaining an implicit list, which isn't possible to efficiently to do in PyMalloc. So this design mostly precludes swapping allocators with the pi mem set allocator API. You can't replace mem alloc with another custom allocator without breaking the garbage collection and thread tape collection. Uh, is not thread safe. Okay. Thread safe implementation of dictionaries and other collections that avoid locking during most non-mutating access. Oh, interesting. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of this either. Yeah, so, so you see like a lot, a lot of this ends up being informed very much by if you're assuming that Python is going to be used in mostly a single threaded environment, then there's no reason for you to worry about building, for example, a thread safe dictionary on reads where like you don't really need to lock data if you're reading from a dictionary, right? You would only need to lock a dictionary if you're writing to it, or maybe you could do a copy on write again. Regardless, uh, these are all hard problems. And this is exactly what memalloc does, which is, you know, created by Dan at Microsoft, right? So that's as much detail as we're gonna go in here. So the, the garbage collector uses a single threaded uh, stop the word implementation, stop the world. So it uses the eval breaker mechanism to signal and wait for other threads to uh, reach and pause at a safe point. 
So the existing GIL APIs are repurposed to support the garbage collector, and the garbage collector doesn't wait on threads that call the pi eval release thread, ones that have released the GIL. This is important so that threads blocked on IO don't prevent garbage collection process. Okay, so CPython uses a global linked list of objects tracked by the garbage collector. So yeah, so it's a linked list. Uh, so is there a way to batch resize images using only Python without writing to file? I think HiFaced AI has that implemented. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, I love this, like when chat is answering their own questions, perfect. So CPython uses, yeah, so so it's a globally linked list of objects because you're gonna basically deallocate stuff in a certain order. Uh, so this like prevents you from basically removing stuff, like the, the containing scope of something before removing like the, 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 the inner scope. And it just like makes sure that like you have access to the thing that you're removing. This is the way I would think about it. So the garbage collector scans each block in the heap to find garbage collected tracked objects and unallocated blocks are currently untracked, have the least significant bit of the first world set to zero. This is an interesting world. So stop the world, stop the world. Oh, I see. So all like, okay, it just, okay. So, so I, I remember this. So, so th they, they do mention this and like, I remember this from early days of reading Java uh, where, yeah, like basically you stop everything until garbage collection is happening. So that's why often in Java programs, you'll see sort of like the spike, like let's say the program will run like this and there's sort of a spike and then it runs like this. So, and like, let's say this is uh, latency and then this is time. Like, uh, and then this would be stop the world. Okay. Uh, so instead garbage, like our, maintain a separate mem alloc heap. Uh, okay, so, so same idea, like a heap, because when you're calling, like heap will have some sort of key. So either by, okay, so like a min or a max key. So it still enforces an order in which you're going to garbage collect stuff, but it sounds like it's more efficient than the linked list and easier to manage. I think that's going to be hard to say why without going a bit more into the internals of memalloc. Uh, maybe that's something we could do uh, in, in another stream. The existing garbage, uh, the gil APIs are repurposed for the, the guard doesn't wait on threads that call. Okay, yeah. Okay, so method resolution on type. So the method resolution order determines the order in which Python searches the type hierarchy to resolve a method invocation to a concrete function. All right, so this is exactly like, you know, if you've seen some of like, let's say my Julia streams, uh, like when you're just trying to figure out the type of something, well, you know, Python is a dynamic language. And so it's gonna basically assume uh, something very specific. And then if that doesn't work, it's gonna start going back to more, more, general, uh, more general types. Uh, so the cache is not thread safe and multiple threads may try to perform MRO lookups concurrently. This project makes the cache per thread and validations are guarded by a global by runtime mutex. And then the cache adds 96 kilobytes of overhead per thread. For comparison, the people stack size about two megabytes per thread. Okay, so very small, right? This is just, just not significant. So we're basically adding uh, like a 0.1% overhead uh, to be able 0.1 or 10 percent, 10 percent, right? Because 100 kilobytes. Yeah, I think it's 10 percent. Uh, so the cache is not thread safe, and multiple threads may try to perform MRO lookup method resolution order. Okay. Um, so again, um, uh, basically here, what I like about this part is that even doing a lookup of types of an object in Python is done via a search to a global hash table. This global hash table is not thread safe. Therefore, they basically implement a mutex, which basically blocks anyone from, like basically if you're making any changes to this cache, uh, no one else is allowed to until you're done, right? So this adds some overhead as well because you're locking. Um, and then this mutex, I guess, so yeah, like, and then there's sort of the memory overhead of the mutex. Uh, there is essentially just garbage collection in general where they use memalloc. They use a thread safe memory allocator and they start using either deferred reference counting or immortalization to stop counting stuff that don't need to be counted to simplify the implementation. All right, so we're already making good progress. And so now it looks like we're at the nastiest section, right? So the, 
uh, let's go here. The, the rest is easy performance and stuff, right? So let's let's get let's get to the meat of this. So this section describes the implementation of thread-safe collections that avoid locks and expensive operations and the typical fast path for read access. So again, yeah, when you're reading stuff, you don't want to be locking. So it's implemented in the list and dict classes. Although the design is thread safe, it's optimized primarily for single thread access because these workflows are most common. All right. So use a per collection lock to protect against concurrent modifications and the cost of a lock modification is relatively small, avoiding the lock. Uh, just give me a second to understand this part. Uh, load the address of the item, increment the reference card of the item, return the address of the item. Okay, the steps for achieving an item. Yeah, I mean, this is just how reference counting uh, would be done right now, I guess. And then the additional hazard of that steps and one, one and two are not performed together as an opt auto atomic operation. Uh, oh, I see, okay. Yeah, I see, I see, okay. So if, you, if you're reading and writing something uh, while someone else is loading and before they update the reference count, basically you could have be updating the reference count for the wrong thing. And this is why locks make tons of sense. So let's see how they do this instead. Uh, requiring a per collection lock on both read and write operation. Uh, yeah, so they're saying, yeah, you could do locks, but ideally we want to avoid locks for reads. So this is exactly what we're getting to, but like locks for writes are unavoidable. Uh, unless you just want to copy, uh, copy everything by default, like not even copy on write, just copy. Okay, so first we change the second step to a conditional increment reference to handle the case where the reference count is zero. So load the address of the item and then increment the reference count of the item. If it's not zero, otherwise retry the entire operation and then return the address of the item. How does this work? So increment the reference count of the item and if it is non zero, if it's non zero, otherwise retry the entire operation. So Oh, I see. So it's sort of like explicitly measuring any changes, right? Like as in, if if someone else is just saying, like like if if it is zero, then you know for a fact that someone else read the data or wrote to it, and in that case, just reload the operation. I see. Interesting. Or like wait, basically. But this again feels like a locked read to me. But maybe I didn't understand it. Maybe it'll make more sense in a second. So we can add an additional constraint to the system. The memory underlying Python objects can only be reused for other Python objects of the same size, even if the memory is reused. And so an additional step to the algorithm to avoid returning objects reusing the same memory, but not in the collection. So load the address of the item, increment the reference count if it's not zero, otherwise retry. Verify that the item still exists at the same collection in the collection, otherwise retry, and then return the address of the item. Oh, I see. So this is basically detecting whether a copy occurred. So this leaves unresolved the issues due to underlying memory being freed and potentially reused or returned by the system operation. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. So if it was ref counted to zero, uh, the OS is going to get rid of it, uh, right? Oh, I see. So it's almost like every thread is doing its own garbage collection here. Like I guess it's more of like a distributed garbage collection where yeah the os may do some stuff or the general python runtime may do some stuff but you can sort of ignore it i guess uh the memory allocator can only reuse uh, memory for python objects of the same size for the duration of the read operation so, oh i see so yeah so they're basically saying how do we make sure that we can read stuff in a thread safe way and then it's sort of like in steps. One is this increment the reference count to verify that the, that the item still exists in the same location. An additional wrinkle is that Python collections are resizable. Oh, and this is all just implemented for lists and dictionaries, by the way, which, you know, if you've seen my other videos, you can implement all data structures with lists and dictionaries. So this is why it's such a big deal, right? The fact that there's only uh, two key abstractions in Python definitely makes uh, library maintainers like life a lot easier. Uh, in a PyDict keys object, these back aren't Python objects may be freed when the collection is resized. This requires adding additional steps and a constraint to the retrieval algorithm. So verify that the version count did not change. Load the version count from the collection. Okay. 
So in general, like if I, if I were to summarize all of these tricks, like what they really have in common is basically runtime checks that you can check for whether things changed without blocking. Like this is sort of like the main theme of all of these tricks, whether you do this by how, looking at like a local reference count versus like the, the program ones, whether you do this by checking whether the program is still in the same location, whether you look at, let's say, a version counter where if a program changes, you update its version. Uh, you know, like this could be like part of the object, right? So let's say like obj dot something, like it just has like a method. Uh, so sorry, like like a, like a an, uh, an object on the... Um, like, sorry, like a variable stored on the object that would basically have the, the version counter. Um, okay, the so thread states and the GIL API. So the GIL APIs, PI, eval, acquire, read, release threads are still useful even though they no longer acquire a global lock. So threads can be in an attached or detached state. Uh, and the garbage collector uses these states to avoid waiting on threads in the detached state, which may be blocked on I.O. Additionally, the thread safe safety schemes take advantage of these states because threads in the detached state cannot have any dangling pointers to Python objects. But they do not rely on the same, for example. Okay. So this is interesting. So definitely just like change the meaning of like what the GIL APIs do. Um, so basically, because he doesn't want to rewrite like all of the Python code base and all of the Gil code base. It's just he's sort of reinterpreting uh, what what the functions do. All right. And then like basically uses the touch state to say I'm waiting on IO. Okay. Very cool. So this project substantially modifies the Python bytecode interpreter, CVALC. So the goals were to improve single thread performance, reduce the performance impact. Uh, this project contained fewer changes to the core Python interpreter, but it proved difficult to, to integrate the third reference counting uh, to a few new opcodes, something like, like the load global caching were not thread safe. I eventually concluded that it was not worth trying a substantial rewrite of the bytecode interpreter to address these challenges. Okay, so now we're covering benchmarks. So we're basically saying on 20 threads, we are about 18 times faster. So it's pretty much like linear speed ups roughly. Uh, register machine accumulator registered model. Now you see, it's like the, the, the JavaScript, uh, like, like there's a JavaScript uh, influence here. Partly the accumulator register was to make the ref frequent reference scanning operations in the interpreter efficient and enable the compiler to make efficient use of CPU registers by keeping the number of live variables across external function calls small. It's hard to measure the impact of the design choice, probably worth revisiting it at some point in the future. The new interpreter, okay. So the interpreter operates on tagged Python object pointers. So each interpreted register, if it's not empty, stores a Python object pointer tagged with the least significant bit set to whether the reference count should not be decremented when the register is cleared. Oh, I see. It does feel like sort of a hack together borrow checker from Rust at this point, the more I look at this. Sure, yeah. So, so this essentially comes down to basically very efficiently being able to count reference count by using registers. So optimize function calls. Uh, the interpreter uses a linear resizable stack to store function call frames, an idea taken from Lua JIT. So the stack stores the interpreter registers, so local variables plus space for temporaries, plus some information per function call, and it avoids the need for allocating pi frame objects for each call. Interesting, okay. Okay, load global caching, load attribute, load method opcodes.
Okay, again, and so for for loading variables or loading methods, uh, they he basically also adds some metadata to them, uh, to figure out like whether, um, whether what falls back to the standard slower operation. A version tag for missing keys. So I think this, is sort of, this was sort of the easy part I mentioned. So the approximate breakdown by feature is uh, is about the resulting interpreter is about nine times nine percent faster than the no guilt proof of concept, uh, or nineteen percent faster than C Python. So per object mutexes and collections, bias reference counting and deferred reference counting, global free lists, mostly tuple and float tree list, and then one percent is immortalization. Yeah, so I guess basically, yeah, let's say something was global, but actually it isn't. Uh, or like basically insist that lists can have global objects. Uh, then, you know, get 2%. Bias reference counting is basically uh, try to remove as much as possible uh, the need to reference count stuff. Uh, per object mutexes and collections. So basically add, make thread safe versions of dictionaries and lists. And uh, queues are also like a similar data structure. So it's interesting he adds it here. Uh, it's a flag day issue. Okay, yeah, so it just doesn't want to break all the code, so made it easy to basically for people to switch. And then there's a whole bunch of compatibility issues with bytecodes and stuff. Okay, so let's just try to go over this like one last time to, to sort of summarize what we learned. So if you just joined, this is great because I'll be summarizing everything from scratch. Um, so basically, it is possible right now to, or at least it's pretty, it's most likely possible that we can remove the guild from Python. Uh, to be able to increase mu increase multi-threaded performance and use like shared memory. Uh, the way this typically works has been with multiprocessing. It's high overhead because it doesn't share memory. It's about like three orders of magnitude slower uh, than threading. And so that takes you from like 100 days. It's not that bad. Then again, I read Perl, C, Go, most good. It was my mental break. I see. Uh, so, yeah. So as a result of this, a lot of times when people are writing Python programs, they'll use two languages. So they'll have like their efficient code written in C or C++, and that code will take advantage of threading. Whereas in Python, because of the global interpreter lock, yeah, you can run multiple threads at once, but only one of them, uh, you can run multiple threads, but only one of them will run at a time. Um, yeah, so the two tricks are for reference counting. So each thread keeps a local reference count to do its own garbage collection. And then there's a few objects uh, that basically take advantage of immortalization. So objects that like are always relevant in Python, like Booleans, for example, or none objects uh, will be immortal. So you don't bother incrementing or you don't bother reference counting them because there's no need to. And then the other one is deferred reference counting. Uh, which is for things like libraries or code or things that like basically uh, they're frequently accessed by multiple threads. Uh, you would basically say, okay, you want to do deferred reference counting for these things. Typically, the, when you're allocating objects in Python, like specifically when we say objects, like let's just assume for now, like, yeah, so when we're allocating objects in Python, it's typically not thread safe. And so they use like a they they use a memaloc, which is a project by Dan at Microsoft that makes this possible. Uh, on track, have the least significant uh, I leave the least significant one uh, selection code extract complex heap. Doesn't wait on threads. All right, 
And now, like, we're no longer waiting on threads to garbage collect, but threads could sort of, like, do their own, like, basically more local uh, garbage collection, uh, which they could do. Uh, like, so here, for example, they... Uh, so, 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 I mean, traditionally, this is done in CPython by having, like, a linked list of all the objects in, uh, that, that need to be garbage collected, but instead, uh, memalloc uses a heap. Uh, I don't know too much more details on this. Uh, also, type resolution uh in python isn't thread safe necessarily so they basically also add some additional data to, to make this possible uh collections in python are not thread safe so primarily lists and dictionaries uh the main improvement here is basically making it possible that when you're reading data you don't need to lock it um because there's just like absolutely no reason to and uh the, the way this is done is basically while you're reading data you keep track of some additional metadata, like a version counter, like the address of the item. And then if it's changed, when you actually are trying to increment something, then you know something changed and you just basically retry and retry to load the object because you know that it changed. Um, right? Because like when people are writing, they're doing it by locking, right? So you know it's sort of a legitimate, like they have a legitimate use for doing that. So it's fine, you know, you can just say, okay, well, it looks like it changed. Uh, therefore, let me let me reload this data. Uh, they also talk about here, like these attached and detached threads. I didn't, I think, understand this uh, very deeply, but the main, the main theme is that instead of re changing the GIL APIs, you essentially reinterpret them. Uh, we'll see what that means. Um, and then here, tagged object representations. Uh, so again, like basically adding more metadata to figure out what to count stuff, uh, optimize function calls, thread safe metadata for load attribute. Uh, and so I don't know, like I feel at a high level to me, at least I probably need more time and maybe I'll do a whole separate stream going through the code base for this thing. But at a high level, I can say that this, the main idea uh, seems to be that instead of you blindly relying on Python to do reference counting, you add some more metadata on objects uh, and the collections to be able to make it easier for them to figure out if it's safe to uh, to, to get rid of them or keep them in, in, in shared memory. Uh, is there a benchmark for a simple parallel map with the change? I think there is, yeah. I think you used Fibonacci here. Let's see, no guild performance, percentage improvement. Do you see a map here anywhere? On pickle. I, I think the example he gave was Fibonacci. Uh, that was the main one, like not a map. But like, ideally it shouldn't be, I guess, too complicated to to, to, to try it out. So I would encourage you to do so. So here it's GitHub. Uh, wait, it was here. Benchmarks that you use, uh, benchmarks. Yeah, I, I can only see this example, but like this is probably how I would try out a map just to see what it's like. Um, Anyway, yeah, I hope this was interesting for everyone. So so thank you for taking the time. I'm definitely uh, rusty from streaming, so it, it felt good to be uh, doing it again. So folks, like, thank you so much for taking the time. I will probably be uh, looking at doing like a follow-up stream where we look at the source code, because I think parts of it were maybe just a tiny bit vague for me to understand. And like, honestly, I don't have all the background. Uh, oh, you want to see the painting? Sure. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, so I mean, to be honest, like I'm not necessarily like an expert at low level memory management. And so uh, hopefully this, this was interesting uh, to you folks still. So yeah, like I said, we'll probably do the code next and thank you so much. And if you enjoyed this, 
Uh, make sure to like and subscribe and tell your friends to follow. I really appreciate it, folks. Thank you so much.